Christianity. Images of injustice, immorality, and irrationality. According to the Bible, we humans were created by a jealous God named Yahweh, and when our physical lives on earth end, our spirits will spend the rest of eternity either in a place called heaven or a place called hell. Heaven is described as a gated, golden city whose gem-studded radiant location is somewhere up above the earth. The residents of heaven never cry, never mourn, and never experience pain. In addition to humans, angels, and a multi-singular god, heaven's tenants include six-winged beasts who have eyeballs covering their entire bodies. These freakish creatures endlessly chant mantric praises to Yahweh, day and night, despite there being no nights in heaven. Hell is described as a dark and miserably painful bottomless pit of everlasting torture located somewhere down below or inside the earth. The sorrowful residents cry and gnash their teeth as they are mercilessly punished with eternal submersion in an unquenchable lake of fire. According to a literal interpretation of these biblical concepts, we have a painless or painful option for how we will experience our eternal afterlives. And the fate of our eternal experience is solely determined not by the merit of our character or actions, but by what we choose to believe. This Christian premise, when objectively critiqued, reveal an unjust and ultimately immoral philosophy. The Bible goes on to explain how Yahweh, in his divine foresight of omniscience, decided that the best way to show his love for and save humanity from his own wrath of eternal damnation would be to send his own son, who is also himself, down to earth to be savagely beaten, brutally whipped, and barbarically nailed to a cross. And as he hung there from the nails in his wrists, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Can't you save yourself and us? But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Merely declaring as true the divinity of Jesus moments before this criminal died is all that was required for him to be pardoned of his crimes and to be rewarded with an eternity in paradise. Inversely, merely disbelieving in the biblical premise is the single unforgivable offense that sentences people to the eternal torture chambers of hell. So, if Osama bin Laden, one of history's most extreme Islamic terrorists responsible for the murders of thousands of innocent people worldwide, decided to believe that Jesus was God seconds before U.S. Navy SEALs blew his brains out. The irreparable destruction his legacy of evil continues to inflict on innumerable innocents globally would be immediately nullified and he would be instantly transported into the infinite blessings of heaven. And inversely, the enlightened liberator, Thomas Paine, the father of the American Revolution, who led colonial America to gain its independence, fervently objected to slavery and inspired transnational human rights across the world, would, for his promotion of reason, free thinking, and deism, be found guilty by the Bible God of crimes so terrible and offenses so unforgivable that his punishment in the afterlife would be an irrevocable, non-cancelable sentence of eternal torture. This Christian premise is neither just nor moral. Think of all the evil people you can, criminals who spend their entire lives inflicting pain, misery, and suffering on others, genocidal dictators, child molesters, rapists, murderers, thieves, and imagine them being rewarded with heaven for simply choosing to believe in Jesus moments before they die. Now think of all the righteous people you can, remarkable people who spend their entire lives dedicated to positively contributing to and improving the quality of life for others. Philanthropists, humanitarians, civil and health freedom activists, discoverers, inventors, and imagine them damned to hell simply for not believing in an ancient claim which, despite their genuine attempts, made absolutely no sense to them. The Christian doctrine is fundamentally immoral. It is an unbalanced wage system where infinite judgments are cast based on finite experiences. This is a repulsively unjust judicial system where bad people can reap the greatest of rewards while good people suffer the worst of punishments. Christianity heightens the value of faith as a virtue while degrading the merit of positive behavior. In order to go to heaven, the Bible God only demands responsibility for beliefs, 
not actions. All accountability for negative behavior is believed to be nullified by Jesus' sacrifice as a scapegoat. This distorted perception of morality is demonstrably detrimental to societies. Statistics show that a faith-based diversion of responsibility to a higher force has a strong correlation to negative social behavior, showing that believers actually produce more crime in the world than non-believers. As we know, in 2005, Gregory S. Paul compared 18 prosperous democracies drawing on a wide range of studies to cross-match theism and atheism with rates of social dysfunction and health. Paul's data correlations show that in general, higher rates of belief in and worship of a creator correlate with higher rates of homicide, juvenile and early adult mortality, STD infection rates, teen pregnancy and abortion, and in almost all regards, higher rates of atheism and acceptance of human evolution consistently correlate with higher rates of social cohesion and lower rates of social dysfunction. None of the strongly secularized pro-evolution democracies experience high levels of measurable dysfunction, and no democracy is known to have combined strong religiosity and popular denial of evolution with high rates of social health. Of the first world democratic countries examined, Japan had the highest percentage of atheists, highest percentage of evolution acceptance, and highest rates of social cohesion or the lowest percentage of believers and the lowest crime rates. The United States of America had the highest percentage of believers, highest percentage of evolution deniers, and the highest rates of social dysfunction. The USA led with the highest rate of teen pregnancy and the highest murder rate, a homicide rate five times greater than in Europe and ten times greater than in Japan. America, the land of the free, the sweet land of liberty, has the world's largest prison population. When polled by the Federal Bureau of Prison Statistics, American inmates overwhelmingly self-identified as Christians. Granted, by definition, these criminals are not the most trustworthy of subjects, and a remedy for the undesired self-concept of a convicted societal outcast is to adopt the belief in a friend who is forgiving and unconditionally loving. If the data showed that the U.S. enjoyed higher rates of social health than the more secular pro-evolution democracies, then the opinion that popular belief in a creator is strongly beneficial to national cultures would be supported. Although they are by no means utopias, the populations of secular democracies are clearly able to govern themselves and maintain social cohesion. Indeed, the data examined in this study demonstrates that the only more secular pro-evolution democracies have, for the first time in history, come closest to achieving practical cultures of life that feature low rates of lethal crime, juvenile adult mortality, sex-related dysfunction, and even abortion. The least theistic, secular, developed democracies such as Japan, France, and Scandinavia have been most successful in these regards. The non-religious, pro-evolution democracies contradict the dictum that society cannot enjoy good conditions unless most citizens ardently believe in a moral creator. The widely held fear that a godless citizen we must experience social disasters is therefore refuted. Contradicting these conclusions requires demonstrating a positive link between theism and social conditions in the first world with a similarly large body of data, a doubtful possibility in view of the observable trends. This trend of high theism, high social dysfunction, high atheism, high social cohesion was found to remain constant not only between countries but also within them. The strongly theistic anti-evolution communities within the United States have worse homicide, mortality, STD, youth pregnancy, and marital related problems than the more secular communities. It is to be determined the precise degree to which cause versus effect is responsible for the observed correlations between social conditions and religiosity versus secularism. Nonetheless, it is more than apparent that religious faith is not virtuous and is indeed harmful. In addition, the faith propositions themselves are glaringly paradoxical to any intellectually honest rational thinker as forgiveness and compassion are discordant with eternal torture. If God exists, God is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good. A perfectly good being would want to prevent all evils. An omniscient being knows every way in which evils can come into existence. An omnipotent being who knows every way in which evil can come into existence has the power to prevent that evil from coming into existence. A being who knows every way in which evil can come into existence, who is able to prevent that evil from coming into existence, and who wants to do so, would prevent the existence of that evil. If there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good being, then no evil exists. Evil exists. 
which logically contradicts the existence of an omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good being, or God. Christian philosophers like Peter Kreeft propose the following apologetics for this paradox. God may use short-term evils for long-range goods. In the strength of brevity and with the privilege of standing on the shoulders of Epicurus, David Hume once formulated the following insight. If God is able to prevent evil, but not willing, then he is malevolent. God created the possibility of evil, but not the evil itself, and that free will was necessary for the highest good of real love. Being all-powerful doesn't mean being able to do what's logically contradictory, like giving freedom with no potentiality for sin. In short, if God created the possibility of evil, then God is malevolent. In depth, if free will is a precursor to sin, then there can be no free will in heaven because there is no sin in heaven. If free will is necessary for the highest good of real love, then heaven is also void of the highest good of real love since there is neither free will nor sin in heaven. Ironically, heaven was the birthplace of sin through Lucifer and the original Hell's Angels. So applying Kreef's apologetics to the Bible's claims, we have free will and sin in the old heaven, no free will and no sin in the new heaven, thus a malevolent god who is selective in engaging his powers to prevent evil. According to the Bible, God is omnipotent. The definition of omnipotence is unlimited power. Unlimited power is a paradox. It is logically impossible because if one can do anything, then one can create something one cannot do, thus one cannot do anything. Theologians explain how the Bible has been retranslated over and over so that, in this case, the word omnipotence may inaccurately describe the original author's intent. This type of retranslation error may be the cause for the biblical contradiction mentioned earlier of heaven both having nights and not having nights at the same time. It is precisely this attribute, the Bible's subjection to conflicting interpretations, which is the cause for the many subdivisions within Christianity. The same sects have reinterpreted the same text differently in different ages. This absence of interpretive consensus for the infallible Word of God negates the Bible's divine authorship claim for such a loving and omniscient deity would ensure lucid communications and comprehension of a critically consequential universal message. God's own suffering and death on the cross brought about his supreme triumph over the devil. An eternal being, by definition, is incapable of dying, so death in this sense is merely a change of forms from physical to non-physical. The changing of forms is allegedly something that every human will experience, and thus not, by any respectable stretch of the imagination, a praiseworthy sacrifice. In fact, it is a contemptible decision for the choice to unnecessarily design a system which demands a barbaric slaughter and then willfully subject oneself to this torture is the definition of masochism. God uses suffering to bring about moral character. Is he able to prevent suffering but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Suffering can bring people closer to God. Suffering also causes people to wake up to the paradoxical nature of this Bible God. Many, many people lose their faith after considering or experiencing the severity of the needless suffering the earth is plagued with. Child sex, slavery, disease, epidemics, mass starvations, genocide. One thing that suffering adults and lonely children have in common is they both experience genuine comfort by creating imaginary friends. The ultimate answer to suffering is Jesus himself, who, more than any explanation, is our real need. I would prefer to say that Christianity is, by definition, incoherent and contradictory, and thus that it allows any number of readings, and if people wish to find authority ah. from these texts, they'll always be able to do so. What we have here, picked from no mean source, is the distillation of precisely what is twisted and immoral in the faith mentality. It's essential fanaticism, its consideration of the human being as a raw material, and its fantasy of purity. Once you assume a creator and a plan, it makes us objects. In a cruel experiment, 
whereby we are created sick and then commanded to be well. I'll repeat that. Created sick and then ordered to be well. And over us to supervise this is installed a celestial dictatorship, a kind of divine North Korea. Exigent, I would say more than exigent, greedy for uncritical praise from dawn until dusk, and swift to punish the original sins with which it so tenderly gifted us in the very first place. An eternal, unalterable judge, jury, and executioner against whom there could be no appeal, and who wasn't finished with you even when you died. However, let's not say there's no cure. Salvation is offered. Redemption, indeed, is promised at the low price of the surrender of your critical faculties. Religion, it might be said, it must be said, would have to admit makes extraordinary claims, but though I would maintain that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, rather daringly provides not even ordinary evidence for its extraordinary supernatural claims, to insist that we are created and not evolved in the face of all the evidence. Religion forces nice people to do unkind things and also makes intelligent people say stupid things. Hand the small baby for the very first time, is it your first reaction to think, beautiful, almost perfect, now please hand me the sharp stone for its genitalia that I may do the work of the Lord. No. As the great physicist Steven Weinberg has very aptly put it, in the ordinary moral universe, the good will do the best they can. The worst will do the worst they can, but if you want to make good people do wicked things, you'll need religion. Religion, in fact, any form of faith, because it is a surrender of reason, it is a surrender of reason in favor of faith, is a fantastic force multiplier. A tremendous intensifier of all things that are in fact divisive rather than inclusive. That's why its history is so stained with blood. Not just crimes against humanity, crimes against womanhood, crimes against reason and science, attacks upon medicine and enlightenment, all these appalling things. There is no conceivable way that by calling on the supernatural, you will achieve anything like your objective of a common humanism, which I think you're quite right to say is our only chance of, I won't call it salvation. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I appreciate your thoughtful comments.